So I've written up here, I believe in your awesome. Um, and I want to start there because so many times when you come in and hear people speak, they're telling you to be more or change yourself or um, you need fixing or something like that. And I believe that all of the awesomeness is already in you. And what we're going to do today is actually take some of that and show it to the people in the room and hi to the folks on the WebEx to talk to them too. Because I believe that if you can articulate why you are fabulous and share that with other people, that you can have really dramatic impact. I'm also not just going to stand here and talk at you. Um, I'm going to ask some of you to get up here and play with me. I know a lot of you are all like, yeah, no. And your hands are going down. You're like, I'm not going to make eye contact. So I'm going to start by just giving you a bit of a high ROI on participating. So Sarah, Sarah where did she go? She's hiding in the back. Actually just said to me a minute ago, so she was at the Ellie Mae event, and she said, oh, I was really bummed after you did this that I didn't volunteer. Um, so one of your very own, and we're going to have a session later, volunteered. Um, and I've had lots of people get up and play with me on stage. And um, one of my favorite things is getting emails from them where they said, wow, I was really nervous, but you said blah. And I went off and did blah, and then this magic thing happened. And magic things can be promotions. They can be sometimes new jobs. I am not telling you all to quit Ellie Mae. This seems like a fantastic company. Let me just put that out there. Um, all the way through to executives realizing that they didn't understand how to articulate the fabulousness of their people. And when they started doing that, the magic that happened within their team. It's this beautiful, amazing um, amplification of each other, and then, and sorry fellas, I'm kind of a lady badass fan, how women can specifically help each other in this space, and amplifying each other, and how we all take leadership roles and move ourselves forward, both professionally and personally. So if you're not bought into the idea of volunteering, I'm not gonna force you, but just know good things happen when that does. Okay, so where did all of this start? So I'm standing here because of an idea an idea that I had to learn again very recently. An idea that every decision made about you and your opportunities is made in a room that you are not in. And I'm going to talk about that a lot today. Um, and this happened twice to me recently. And both times I was surprised. And both times I was like, well, why are you surprised, you silly girl? You should know this by now. The first time it happened was about six years ago when I was still at CBS. And I was ready to go. I'd been at the company for eight years. I didn't see a learning opportunity for me, and I thought it was time for a new challenge. And so I had been out interviewing with companies, and I actually had two different job offers on the table, and I'd already kind of decided on one. And then a girlfriend of mine called up, and she was the general counsel at Pandora at the time, and she said, Pandora could really use you. And this was when Pandora was a little bitty company, and everybody was walking around going, oh, yeah, another music company? They're going to fail in five months. And I said, well, but I'm friends with Dee, and I absolutely want to support her, so I'll go in and do her favor. Um, and they needed somebody to help them scale their revenue operations. And I came in, and like a very bad interview, I did not prep for my meeting, because I didn't want the job. But I thought, well, this will be interesting, and I want Delita to look good. And so I didn't do a lot of research on the executives I was meeting with, and I was meeting with um, the senior leadership team that was there at the time, except for one of them. I knew that on my interview list was this guy named Steve Cakebread. And if you don't know who Steve is, Steve started Autodesk in Asia for them. He also was one of the very first executives at Salesforce. He was actually the CFO there and helped build Salesforce from the bottom up. He's also, if you're a fan of the Napa Valley area, um, the family of Cakebread Wines. Um, so unbelievably successful, and as somebody who was in kind of engineering, operations, building software space, I was like, oh my god, I'm kind of getting to meet one of the pioneers, really, of cloud computing and SaaS. And I was super excited about that. So I went through all of my interviews, and Steve was the last one I was going in with. And I sat down, and I was all like, oh, I've got to be prepared. And I said, Mr. Cakebread, it's so lovely to meet you. What can I tell you about myself? And he looks at me, and without a beat, he says, Joanna, I know exactly who you are, what you've accomplished, and what you're capable of. The job is yours if you want it. What do you want to know from me? And I was like, 
holy crap, right? You don't usually get that as a first question. And I, of course, because as you will learn, I'm a tiny bit sassy pants, said, well, Mr. Kate Bread, I know exactly who you are. And I also know some people who were early stage at Salesforce, and I know what their net worth is. So I'm guessing yours is a tiny bit bigger. So why are you sitting here working for this little dinky company that might fail in five months and not sitting by the pool eating bonbons? And then he laughed, which was a very good sign. Um, and uh, it was his answer to his question that actually made me decide to change my mind and go work for Pandora, which turned out to be one of the best things I ever did. Um, I had a fantastic time, and over that period of time, the company went from 100 million to nearly a billion in revenue, and my team alone went from 30 to 400 people, and it, it was just hold on to the rocket ship sort of experience that we all hear about and dream about, and I got to, to build my fantasy team. Um, but as I started this story, I talked about that I forgot twice that every decision is made in a room that you're not in. And um, about four years into my tenure at Pandora, and I had the team and we had done some really remarkable things by this point. And when you're growing that fast, you kind of have to make magic happen. And, um, but the CFO, so Steve, and then the CEO, who had become a, a very dear friend and mentor to me as well, decided that they were done. They were done because you date a company, you do not marry it, which means that the inevitable breakup has to happen at some point. And they decided to move on, and I was super sad because I was like, I don't have my two mentors and sponsors, but I've done a really great job. Like, look at all the stuff I've done. You know, I've made decisions, the team is amazing, we're killing all of the numbers. I've got all sorts of like, look how great we are. And um, they brought in a new CEO. And I forgot that I needed to re-interview for my job. I forgot that he didn't really care about what I'd done. He much more cared about what I thought I was going to do. And while I had done an excellent job, I was not talking about the future. I was not actually thinking about what did he think of Joanna as a contributor to his leadership team. And the inevitable happened. And I got pulled aside and they said, well, you know, your team is really big and you know, you've done a great job, but we think that um, somebody else should take it to the next level. And I was heartbroken. I was absolutely devastated because this team was my baby, the ideas, everything that had happened, and I cared desperately about the entire organization. And they were saying, you can't, you can't take care of your baby anymore. Somebody else is gonna do a better job than you are. And after I got done being sad and mad and a little bit angry, I will also say, I decided it was time for me to have a bit of a self-reflection conversation with myself and say, okay, so like, what happened here? What could you have you controlled? What couldn't you have controlled? Um, was it really, was it, how much of this do you own? Because I blamed them entirely at the beginning, as one does when one gets, in essence, fired. Very gracefully fired, but fired nonetheless. And I realized that, yes, there were some things that were out of my control, but the thing that was in my control, I had forgotten that every decision made about you and your career opportunities is made in a room that you're not in, and I didn't manage that conversation in that room. Now, another thing that had happened in that time was as we were building the team at Pandora, and I understand we've got, how many engineers do we have in the room? Just in, yeah, we've got a bunch of engineers. You are my people, everybody is my people, but do love the engineering team. So I had a fairly sizable engineering team that reported into me, and as the leader of this team, one of my core responsibilities was to figure out what each individual person was really great at and, max, and optimize their um, contribution to the team. Because we were moving so fast that we were pulling people onto projects at all of the time. And then also hear from the team what ideas they had. And what I noticed from um, my engineering team, unlike my client-facing team, who were very quick to bring me all sorts of brilliant ideas, my engineering team were not as vocal. And I was like, well, hang on a second, they're all brilliant. We hired them because they were brilliant. What's going on here? And I actually had a couple of lunches with them. And I said, so why aren't you bringing me ideas? And they were like, well, because we share them with our friends first, and then they knock them down. And I'm like, well, hang on a second. That, that makes no sense. Why are all of your ideas unequivocally being knocked down? Like, what's going on here? And as I went through a lot of Q&A with them, I realized that nobody had sat down with my engineering team and said, this is how you pitch an idea. This is how you take an idea to, through to execution the same way that, say, a sales organization is taught all of those skills and tools. And I said, well, there's no reason why the engineering team can't go through sales training. 
Um, why don't I give them all of the tools and the ideas around how do you bring an idea forward so that they can bring their ideas forward? Because I have no doubt that they have great ideas. And long story short, the entire organization went through what I called Sales 101 with them. And they all learned what a normal salesperson learns about how do you sell through an idea so that they could bring their ideas, which then contributed to the ability for us as a team to accelerate. And it was this whole, I realized as they were going through this process, that the engineers as a whole were fairly shy and private and really loved working in the details and were not comfortable and didn't think it was authentic to come out and go, I have a great idea. And those decisions being made in rooms that they were not in were not working in their favor. So thank you to the engineering team because it's actually your fault that I'm standing here today. Um, because you guys helped me realize that this idea of learning how to talk about that can really have major impact. Which is why I'm going to ask my first volunteer, who is game for coming up and playing with me? Who's going to be super brave this morning? Come on down. Suma, very nice to meet you and your fabulous sweater. Hi. Joanna, come on up. Why don't you come stand right here so everybody can see you? There are no wrong answers to this. Okay. I promise you. Mm -hmm. So what does Ellie Mae do and why is it important? Well, I'm, this is my fourth month in the company, by the way. I'm fairly new. So, okay. <laughs> well, Ellie Mae, uh, Ellie Mae has a, um, a flagship product called Encompass, which provides automated solutions for um, residential mortgage industry. And, um, well, mortgage is so complex, so we make it all simple, where we automate everything from the loan um, origination to closing of the loan. Very good. <laughs> Anybody from the marketing team in here? How did she do? Good job. Well done for four months in, clearly. Okay, so what do you do and why is it important? Sure. I'm an engineering manager here on the CRM team. Okay. And um, um, I'm building a team for um, lead management. It is a product offering on CRM. So uh, I'm building a team for um, um, you know lead management, which is a product offering where we nurture, like we ingest leads from third-party providers, and we nurture that through um, associating them with campaigns and uh, stuff like that. Okay. So you've talked about what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Not what does your team do. What do you do? What do I do? What do you, like, who are you, if I was to meet you at a networking event, mm -hmm. on stage in front of, ignore them, it's okay. It's just <laughs> if I was to meet you at a networking event and I said, so what do you do? Well, I'm, a, I'm an engineering manager for software applications and I, I enjoy building high performing teams and uh, building products. That's what I do. Okay, okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, how many of you, if you were at a networking event and you heard that answer would be all like, oh my God, I have to talk to her immediately. Like, how many of you had an emotional reaction to that answer? Okay, so we had no hands, that's okay. Because we're gonna fix that. I'm gonna have all of your hands up. This is my new, new squad goal here. Um, I wanna change your introduction statement mm -hmm. to make it a bit more of a powerful statement because um, the idea behind all of this is that we buy on emotion, we justify on fact. And that usually may give you a real example. So when you, did you buy this beautiful sweater online or did you buy it in a store? I bought it in a store. And when you walked in, did you go, oh my God, it will be mine. Oh yes, it will be mine. Because you were like, this is a fabulous sweater. Well, yeah, usually I try to connect emotionally to everything I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued. So, but, so you saw the sweater, you were like, this is fabulous. You tried it on, you went, I look fabulous. And then you looked at the price tag, right? Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, so bought on emotion justified on fact when it comes to a sweater. And you think about everything that we do, it's that. You think about when you go out, last time you made a new friend, and you went, oh, they are super cool. I want to know them. You had an emotional reaction to them, so we're going to work on your emotional act, reaction. So um, I'm intrigued about this whole emotion. Are you an engineer? You are in an engineering role, right? Yes, I, I was an engineer for, you know. You're now leading a team of engineers. Yes, that's awesome. correct. Love that you're taking an emotional approach. Why do you think that's important? Well, I believe it's the passion which drives everything. Right? Okay. And um, once you're passionate, and then automatically you're determined to do something, and that gives you that energy, and that, and once you're set on a goal, then you drive towards it. Okay. And so where did that? I'll come back in. You're not going to run away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it's going to be this long, anyway. So yeah. So well, this is part of the fun. Um, 
So where did that aha moment come for you? Like, what happened? How old were you when you went, oh, it's all about what's in here as much as it's what's in here? I mean, I'm a person who is, um, like, once I set my goals on something, I'm determined to drive there. Yeah. And to set a goal, there has to be some kind of a connection where you feel passionate about, hey, I want to, like, I want to be a developer. Yeah. Oh, I want to really be a manager. Or, hey, I want to be good at this music. Like, this there. So, so um, you're a musician to be? Um, yes. <laughs> well, Have you always been a musician? Uh, well, from my young days, you know, like I learned an Indian uh, instru instrument okay. called Reena, so I okay. that, yeah. Okay. I think I have enough. <laughs> you, so did you, I just want to point out here, how many of you knew, how many, how many people in the room do you know, roughly? A um, couple of people. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, how many of you now are already like, she's super cool, hang on, musician, and uh, you see the hands are going up? <laughs> just from this, like you and I having a chat. Because they all just, you all had an emotional reaction to something that was set up here, right? Um, so I'm going to now reintroduce you to the room, mm -hmm. and we're going to see how they react to it. So hi, it is very nice, I'm playing with all of you, by the way. Okay. Very nice to meet all of you. Um, so often in engineering roles, we think that the work is all up here. It's all mental, and it's all about ones and zeros. But the reality is, is to build a really great engineering team, and to build really great products, you actually have to have a lot in here. And like music and like things that we build in both the arts and the sciences, it's a combination of the head and the heart it's tapping into our passions that really build and develop not only the people who build things, but amazing products at the end of the day. And I do that today as part of the leadership team at Ellie Mae. Thank you, that yeah. was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to get to them in a second. Quick question. Would you say something like that? Does that sound like you? Um, I think yes. Yes, you would yes. say something. OK. Uh -huh. Because all I did there was take your ideas uh -huh. and repackage them a tiny bit. Uh -huh. um, and then quick question for the room. How many of you are like, I want to talk about this head heart thing? And you're all like, I'm in. Can we see the hands? All right. We went from zero to a whole ton. The folks on the phone, I'm hoping you all put your hands up too. Um, but that's the difference. Uh -huh. That's the, the idea is you're actually not only talking about yourself in much more of an emotional, like connect to who you are as a person, mm -hmm. other than just talking about your role, but you're also giving us an insight into who you are and why we think you're cool and interesting and all that sort of stuff. Awesome, cool. thank, thank you, you for thank being you. A, first, a first one up. Thank you, thank you. good job here. See, now how many of you are like, I should have volunteered, right? So yeah, it's that, think about, um, for the managers in the room, you're going to now know she's the head heart engineer. You are now the head heart engineer. Head heart. Start with passion. It's not about ones and zeros. Um, so it's that every decision made about you and your opportunities is made in a room that you're not in. And that the second part of the truth that I'm going to talk about today is that other people tell your story. So what just happened in here is you've now got mm, 50, 60 people who are going to remember you in a really unique and compelling way. Because how many of you in the room would say you are in management in engineering? We've got one other person. We've got, yeah, so we've got a half cut. So it's actually making you all slightly different in your own way. What I'm not going to talk about today, but I actually want to just kind of seed up as ideas is even if you have a great story, people listen to it differently. So think about the conversations I had with an engineering team, how they communicated wasn't resonating through how people talk to you. So if you're talking to somebody who's heavy in finance or you're talking to a salesperson or you're talking to a customer, how do people think about your story? When it's working, do you have a plan for what your ask is? So often I talk to people and I say, okay, so what do you want to be known for? What is your personal value proposition statement, which is what we did up here. And now they've gone, oh my God, you're super cool and awesome and I want to get to know you. Do you have a next step? Do you have an ask if you prepared for that? Because I promise you, something will happen if you go out and practice this. Um, then of course, the just because they think you were awesome today does not mean they think you're awesome tomorrow. You have to keep redating and reintroducing and reinventing who you are. And then last but not least, that your story changes over time. 
So we just did a lovely, thank you again, example right here. Um, I have no doubt, I talked about how you date a company, you date a job, you actually don't marry it. Like we all evolve over time. We all have different jobs. I used to be known as um, the swimsuit lady because I used to run a chain of very high-end fancy bathing suit stores in Texas and I could put women into swimwear and make them feel good about themselves, which was a magic freaking trick. Um, so if you all need a swimsuit, I'm your gal. I still have that magic talent. Um, and then uh, one day, one of my swimsuit models turned to me and she goes, yeah, there's this company that's doing this internet thing. This was 1995. It was very new. We were on 14.4 dial-up at the time. And she goes, and you're really good at sales and you're really kind of a nerd. You should go talk to them. And I did and found myself working for a small company called City Search, which some of you in the room might remember who they were, um, which then took off this entire career into startups, which is what brought me to OpenTable and Pandora and all these other companies. And we do change, we do change our story over time. So it's looking at what are you known for and how do you talk about yourself during that time. And I want to come back to this idea of every decision made about you in a room is made in a room that you are not in. Um, if you follow me on the social medias, and I am everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it, I am the only, well, no, that's not true. There are two Joanna Bloors on the planet. The other one is 27. She lives in Leeds. I totally cyberstalk her because <laughs> she is my, we share a brand name, and we have a very mutual agreement that uh, she will not do anything with the name Joanna Bloor, and I will own everything. Um, and then I help her out on the side. It's a very, very good thing. Um, you have to think about these things. So this is uh, actually a picture of the dining room of the W Hotel in Washington, D.C. It's about, I'd say, a block and a half from the White House, a really lovely location, and as you can tell, a really lovely dining room. And as I was saying, if you uh, follow me on Facebook, you will find that one of my favorite things to do is eavesdrop over conversations when I travel, because I travel a ton and I'm usually by myself, and so listening to other people's stuff is super fun. And I always protect the innocent, but I do, I have a bit of sense of humor about things. But I was sitting in the very back corner having breakfast by myself, and right in front of me were two guys um, having a conversation. And the guy with his back to me was clearly the boss man. Um, and the guy in front of him, who I could actually see kind of, I wasn't trying not to stare, um, was clearly his subordinate, but was a manager in the company. I have no idea what the company was or who they were talking about. But they were talking about these two women, Jane and Jennifer. And they were clearly having conversations about who was going to get promoted and who wasn't. And they started to talk about Jane. And so the boss man says, so what's up with Jane? And they were like, Jane is fantastic. Really love her attitude. She really works well with the team. She really brings unique and original ideas to the table. And not only does she bring them to the table, but she's thought through all of the ramifications. She's actually even talked to the rest of the team around these ideas. Um, and some of these ideas have paid off in really um, substantial ways. Like, he was just raving about Jane, about all of the things that we do. So the boss guy goes, so, well, clearly Jane is ready for a promotion because she's, she's really thinking strategically um, and helping the organization. He was like, yes, absolutely, we should put her in the yes pile. And he goes, okay, well, so what about Jennifer? And he goes, well, Jennifer does a great job, too. I can really rely on Jennifer to get shit done. And I was like, oh, dear. And he goes, I really need Jennifer to stay in her role because Jennifer is so key to us accomplishing our goals that we won't be able to do that if Jennifer doesn't stay there. And my heart sunk. And needless to say, Jennifer did not get put in the yes promotion pile. And after these two guys left, I sat there thinking about it because I was, I was talking about this whole day. And I said, what a perfect example for women specifically of where we fall into the, the get shit done girl trap. And this idea of that conversation of every decision is made in a room that you are not in. Because if you think, it, like if I was to ask this entire room, what are you really, really great at? How many of you up until like 10 seconds ago would have said, I am get shit done girl? Yeah, except who's a hiring manager in here? You're a hiring, okay, um, I won't make you get up. So um, <laughs> let's just pretend I now work for you. Congratulations. I'm super awesome. Um, what would happen if I didn't get my shit done? And if I still kind of didn't get my shit done, then what would happen? Yeah. Like, what is the deal? 
you're super nice, because I would have probably fired somebody by now. Um, so I just want to point out for a second. So I talked about, like, it's about uniqueness, it's about boldness, it's about authenticity. But that uniqueness thing is really important. So if all of you are putting up your hand that gets it done is one of the things you're really great at. And I've talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women. The, number two, the two answers I get most frequently from women about what are you really great at is I really, I'm really good at getting shit done. And I'm really good at connecting with people. Well, if everybody has that skill, then it's not a unique thing. I actually was talking with an executive at Salesforce, and I had this conversation with her, and I said, um, so what are you really great at? And we'd already taken the get shit done one off the list. And she goes, well, I'm very strategic. And I went, mm, that's kind of boring. And she got super offended. Um, I just call it like I say it. Uh, she got super offended. And I said, well, so I said, let me th talk you through this for a second. I said, you're you know, on the executive floor at Salesforce. And she goes, yes. And I said, if I walked around your floor and opened all the office doors and said, are you strategic? Are you strategic? Are you strategic? How many of the other executives would say that they were strategic? And she goes, oh, OK, I see you have a point. And I said, so strategic isn't unique. So what are you really all about? And having that deeper conversation around what is your unique contribution to the team? How do you do something that is truly and 100% you so that you stand out in the conversation in the room that you are not in? Because I have no doubt that the head-heart conversation is going to stick to you like glue. Absolutely going to This is an awesome thing to stick to you. But what is your thing? What is the thing that you want to be known for? And I want to talk about this as well. Um, I was working with a client the other day who, in his former career, used to be a quarterback. So I say the word quarterback, and you can s practically see the guy, right? Big, giant, or thing. Um, and if I said, I am a quarterback, you'd be all like, I totally know what your job is. It's very clear, and it's a very clear brand. And he'd come to me because he is no longer a quarterback and was trying to pivot into a new career. And I said, well, you need a new word. I said, because this word quarterback is sticking to you, and people have an opinion about what qu quarterback is. And he was like, ah. I think you are crazy, and I don't believe you, and what do you mean this whole word thing is sticking to me? And I said, well, will you do an experiment for me so you can understand how this works? And um, he said, fine. And I said, OK, for the next five business days, as you go around your business and hang out with people, I want you just to say the word purple to people. And I said, and if anybody says, well, how, purple, what are you talking about? Just say, I'm doing this experiment with this crazy lady. Um, I just, I've been told to say the word purple. And I said, now after five days, if nothing has happened, then feel free to tell me I'm a crazy person. And he goes, OK, I can do that for five days. And so he went out and started saying the word purple to people. I am now super sad. I didn't say like hot pink or something like that, because it would be more fun. Um, but on Wednesday morning at about 11.30, my phone rang from this guy. And I was like, oh, hello. Wonder what's been going on. And I pick up the phone and I go, so what's going on? And he goes, you know exactly what's going on. And I said, do you want to tell me what's going on? And he said, it's 11.30. I've been in the office for two hours. And four different people have come up to me and said, what's with this purple thing I hear you're doing? And he goes, these are four people that I never said the word purple to. And I said, this is the power of having something unique and different that really sticks to you like glue that can follow you through. Now, he's still kind of annoyed at me because the word purple hasn't gone away. Plus, I still tell this story, so it kind of keeps going. Um, I don't feel so bad, because he needs something to balance out quarterback. So it's all good. But having that conversation around what is that word. So you've actually all got, you should have some worksheets. We've given you, I'm a big believer in not only show, tell, but do. You should all have some worksheets for the those of the folks that are on the phone. We will be sending it to you or have already sent it to you. But I want you to see on there, this is the formula of how I created the sentence just now. It's problem, solution, benefit. Problem is what is the thing that you are uniquely good at solving? What are you really great at? What is the solution to that? And oh, by the way, I'm the solution. So who wants to come up and actually go through this exercise with me? I need volunteer number two. All right, come on down. I'm going to catch you next time. All right, so just for the room, because um, I know they you know, most of them, I'm guessing, know who you are. So who are you and what do you do at Ellie Mae? There is no judgment, I promise. <laughs>
So my name is Tracy Springman, and I'm a manager in technical support. OK. Um, we're going to do better than that, because uh, this first rule of Sales 101 training is what you just did. Sorry, I'm going to sound like I'm judging for a second. Is um, Tracy product vomited? So if you're in sales, <laughs> anybody in sales in the room? We've got one person. So the, the rule of sales is you don't go in and start talking about yourself, right? When we introduce ourselves, we seem to do that. And that's not what we're trying to do. So we're actually going to uncover the problem that you solve so we can create your sentence. So Tracy, what are you really great at within the scope of your job? And again, you get another newbie here because I've been here about four months as well. Um, one of the things that I really focus on in, in any management role that I've had is identifying areas for improvement okay. and really being passionate about getting those um, aha moments out of people that work with me or for me, okay. um, that we're making things better, that we continue to work towards improvement. Why? One, it makes me happy. <laughs> you know, just to, just to see that, that um, you've, you've improved something for someone to make their jobs easier, to streamline things. Is it, I think. Does inefficiency irritate you? Yes. Is this, so when you were, talk to me about who you were when you were like 8, 9, 10. Was inefficiency, when things didn't work the way you thought they should when you were 8, 9, 10, did it annoy you then too? It's been a long time since I was 8, 9, 10, OK? <laughs> um, probably to a certain extent, but okay. it's hard to think back that to far. that far. <laughs> um, I asked that question only as a cheat sheet for all of you guys, because when you're struggling with that, what is the thing that I'm really great at? And especially for girls, guys, you're a little bit later. It's more like the 17, 18, 19 for you. Um, but for girls especially, because this is right before all of the hormones and the crazy stuff starts to happen, and it's all right before that. So there's an amazing woman in LA called Antonia Galinda who gave me this language. She calls it the itty bitty shitty committee. This is that jerk that sits on your shoulder and says, you are not good enough, and people are going to judge you, and um, what are they going to say? And it's the person who tells you, you no all the time. When you're 8, 9, 10, that person doesn't exist. They go, they kind of manifest somewhere in puberty and then get bigger and bigger as you move on, shockingly. Um, but who you are when you're 8, 9, 10 and what you were really great at usually manifests in who you are as an adult because as much as I'd like to say I'm not still the 8-year-old Joanna, I'm absolutely still, that, that little girl still absolutely lives inside of me. And so whenever I'm struggling with, like, am I truly being authentic? Am I being real? Am I being that person? that I want to be known for, I go back to that eight-year-old Joanna, and I go, OK, she was fierce, and I loved her. And while, yes, she was a little afraid of things, um, what was the essence of who that girl was? I was performing Big Shock when I was eight, nine, 10. And so tapping into what are the skills there. But I want to come back to this inefficiency thing. Um, where did that, has that been kind of professionally? Is it about the inefficiency piece of it, or is it getting other people to manifest ideas things? That, is, it, that actually makes you happy? I'm not sure. Um, I think it's really kind of a, a bit of both. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, I'm going to stick with the inefficiency one because I've got okay. some fabulous language for you. Oh, good. Okay. Um, but you should use your workshop to figure out how you can do both because you can yeah. also be more than one thing, totally allowed. Okay. So I'm going to reintroduce you to the room. Hi. Um, I'm Tracy. And inefficiency makes my bones hurt. And for companies, I think you have to have somebody in an organization that believes that inefficiency makes their bones hurt. Because when that happens, you actually seek out and look for opportunities to optimize. Opportunities to look at everything and find a new way of doing things, a more efficient way of doing things. Because it's all about how do we grow and how do we move forward. And so as I said, inefficiency makes my bones hurt. And I let them hurt plenty at Ellie Mae because I'm always in search of a new opportunity to optimize what it is we're doing. Very well said, Tracy. Does that work for you? <laughs> Thank you for coming up. Good job. Thank you. All right. You see how that worked? I talked about the problem of inefficiency. The solution is you look for opportunities. Oh, and by the way, Tracy is the solution. It happens quite magically. Um, 
So I want to talk about this on a bigger scale, too. Uh, I'm guessing you all know who this woman is, but can somebody tell me who this is? Cheryl Sandberg. Then what is she known for? What else? Facebook? Oh, and do, I had something about a husband in there? Yeah, dead husband, sadly. Um, so I think Cheryl's, and I want to talk about why she's a very interesting use case for what I'm talking about here. So I have popped Cheryl's face up on endless, endless, endless presentations, and I never um, actually say her name. I've yet to be in a room where people don't know who she is. And then when I ask what is she known for, the number one all answer is always lean in. Lean in is her purple. The number two answer, although you guys were a little louder on the Facebook COO, is dead husband. I'm curious to see if option B becomes her second word. I think she's going to struggle with it because that sounds a little too close to plan B, um, and that's going to be branding confusion. Um, and then the third thing is COO of Facebook. Now, what I think is really interesting about that is, yes, she's known, like you all know her, know her as Lean In, and you all want to get to know her because of Lean In, and secondarily, even tertiarily, because she's the COO of Facebook. And where I think this pays off, especially for those of you that have great big aspirations um, to have impact in the world, which my guess is everybody in here, is if you think about how she's been able to have impact and where she's been able to be in rooms where decisions are being made. So about a year and a half ago, and it happens every year, um, Bain, which is a big uh, financial investment company, brings all of the kind of tech glitterati and media glitterati together. So um, Rupert Murdoch and Barry Diller and all of like Steve Jobs used, used to go, um, Mark Benioff, et cetera, et cetera. And they get to come to this place in Utah um, and bring their lovely wives along. And it becomes this um, really remarkable event. Mark Zuckerberg went um, that year. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, Cheryl was the first woman to be invited on her own being known for brand. Then you think, and I am going to go political for just a second, you think about that picture that was recently taken it, with Trump, with all of the tech leaders. And yes, Ivanka was in the room, but Cheryl was the only other woman in the room. And what was noticeable about that picture is Mark was not there. So the COO, not the CEO of Facebook, showed up in the room. Now what I think is interesting about that is it shows that you do not have to be a 30-year-old founder who has flipped your company for $3 billion to get invited to these things. You can actually be the woman behind the man and get invited to this if you think about this idea of what do you want to be known for. Decisions were made in rooms that Cheryl was not in that got her invited to all of these things. And you think about this idea of Lean In and how it has stuck to her. So if, if you've got big ambitions and big aspirations, I say look to Cheryl and the impact she's able to have just based on her brand and what is she known for. And I would also argue, and for the senior executives in the room, when you're thinking about the women leaders in this organization, why, like the number one problem for companies in the Bay Area today is recruiting all you awesome engineers. And seeing so many women engineers is also mightily impressive. You think about why you come to work for companies and it's not just about the products that you build and deliver. It's actually about the leadership team and the message. And you think about how many people want to go work at Facebook just because Mark and Cheryl work there. Just for the opportunity to work with her and how that can change the conversation. Even for the hiring managers, think about what are you known for, especially if you're a female hiring manager and the impact that you can have in recruiting people into your organization. So not only can this impact you on an individual basis, not only can it actually help you to have a trajectory in your own career, you can actually have amazing impact on all of the people around you. It's, uh, I think this is a really interesting use case. I'm interested to see um, what happens. And what I talked about here was that story is told, told by other people, not told by you, which makes me lead into another volunteer expression. I need two people this time. All right, we've got two people. The two back, we've got the lady in the burgundy shirt and the tan shirt. Do you two know each other? Even better. So hi. Hi, I'm Jasmine. Jasmine? Gulta. Gulta? Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Okay, come on in. You have a special magic job, is I want you just to listen and we're gonna come back to you. Okay, so apparently I have to stand. Oh, let me get you the microphone. All right, you've seen the exercise now. Yes. 
So what's, just so we can level set, what's your normal people job? I am a finance manager. Finance manager, okay. Totally get what that is. Okay. So why are you the best finance manager ever? What is it you're really great at? Well, there's two things, so I wasn't sure which to go with. Um, the first one is that I, um, I think about database architecture. And so I think about how we can apply better data flows to improve our capabilities as a finance team. That makes us scalable. It allows us to, um, it allows us to spend more time analyzing data and thinking of it in different ways versus compiling data or okay. kind of doing the day-to-day -day grind. Okay. Um, the second thing is I'm very passionate about cross-training and enabling the team to share knowledge so that we're more flexible and so that people can um, have growth paths and opportunities and opening that up far before the opportunities become available. Okay. Ooh, you've got some good stuff to work with. This is what, you remember how I said at the beginning, I believe in you're awesome? Had you thought about that for yourself before you walked in this room? Like th these were the two things for you? Well, I was writing them down as we were okay. going through the exercise. But like, no, so before, <laughs> good student, clearly. But like before you came into the room, had you actually written down and said like, this is why I am awesome? I've applied to, well, I, so I joined here a year ago, so I was working on my resume, I was working okay. on interviewing and stuff, so that was about a year ago, and those were the, some okay. of the things that came up at that time. Okay. Um, but this is the first time you thought about it in a year? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's do more than that, right? <laughs> um, okay, how do I want to do this? Okay, I'm gonna do both. Okay. We're gonna see what happens. Um, so hi, I'm Jasmine, it's nice to meet you. Um, I believe in the world of finance that there are really two key things that you have to have in place for a finance organization to not only work through its work appropriately, but also build itself for a future. And that idea of building itself for a future requires two things. One is database architecture, and two is the people. And both of them are about building for the future. So are you thinking about your database architecture so that you can actually spend time analyzing as opposed to just reporting? And when you're thinking about the people, are you thinking about the roles that they need to move towards rather than the role that they have? And I believe, believe bringing the two of those things together in the work that I do at Ellie Mae as a financial manager. Do we like that? Yes. Does that work? Awesome, good job. Okay, you are gonna scooch over. Hi. Were you listening? No, oh, yes, so you do need the microphone. Okay. So you just heard a lot of stuff right here. Yes. And what is your role at LMA? I'm a software engineer. Software engineer. Okay, so um, you have just met the CFO. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is your boss's boss's boss. boss, boss in there. <laughs> oh, oh, even better. Okay, good for you. This is good. You have an Okay, so you just ran into <laughs> Jasmine's boss in the elevator, and she just walked out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, so uh, he doesn't know who you are, we're gonna pretend. So what does Jasmine do? Mm -hmm. How will you answer that question there? I say she works on finance and she uses data to enable the organization to get ahead and she's also a great people person because you know, she likes to have a team uh, get ahead. Awesome. Do you see how that, in just a second, she captured your two things? really, really quickly and easily. And it's that fast. Thank you for being a great helper. I appreciate it. That far, thank you for being a great helper too. I appreciate it. Because that brings you to um, what you're gonna now need to do. And this is on page two in your workbook. Because I'm gonna now ask you all to be super courageous. And I talk about the difference between courage and bravery because they're important. Um, courage by definition is doing something that's super scary even though you don't know how to do it. So kind of like grandma running into a burning building to save a puppy. Bravery is doing something that's super scary and you're so good at it that you're like, I got it. And that is firefighter, right? Taking your sentence that how do you talk about yourself is kind of a weird new thing to do. Like how many of you are like, I'm totally doing this immediately. Yeah, I, I understand <laughs> that you're all like, uh, no. Um, so I'm gonna make this easy for you, and there's homework in here. I want you to write your sentence, and then go take it to five people who know you and love you. Because you remember that itty bitty shitty pity person? We do not need to give that person any fuel because I'm asking you to be authentic and bold about yourself. But go out and talk to five people. Now, caveat on that, it cannot be mom, dad, grandmas, or grandpas. 
because moms love you, whatever comes out of your mouth, and usually they have no idea what you're talking about, right? Um, if you have siblings, they're kind of perfect um, because they will give you the brutal truth. However, when you go out and you practice your sentence, I want you to say, I'm gonna do, I wanna do something really weird I've learned, I wanna practice how I introduce myself to you, and at the end of it, I want you to tell me, as we just did, what did you hear? I don't want them to give you the what do they think, because that's gonna give some fuel to our little itty bitty shitty committee friend here, and they do not need that. I want you to think about little teeny tiny Joanna on the other shoulder going, yes, you are awesome and you are fantastic, and having your, your belief officer on your shoulder. So I want you to hear what are you gonna hear, and what you're gonna get is what just happened up here with how are people gonna reframe what it is that was said about you, because remember, it's not about how you tell your story, it's about how others tell your story. Then about 48 to 72 hours later, I want you to call back that person that you asked and that you did the exercise with, and I want you to say, what do you remember? And what do you remember is gonna help you figure out what is your purple word. Because imagine for a second you found out what your purple word is, and um, imagine at the end of your email, you know how you have those awesome signatures at the bottom? That you wrote, I believe in passion and engineering at the bottom of that. Or I believe in the combination of data architecture and, and people and how they build financial organizations. A very simple, unpushy thing to do just on your email, because we all look down there, just a tiny bit. Now imagine for a second you take that to your LinkedIn profile and instead of putting your job title up there, you actually say something to the effect of Data architecture and people architecture equals excellent finance architecture. That's another way of putting it. Remember how I talked about people buy on emotion and justify on fact? That top half of your LinkedIn profile is all emotion. That bottom part that's the fact. Your fact is your resume. So just thinking about how do you take this idea of who you are and what it is you want to be known for and just spreading it gently across everything. Because I do recognize, especially as women, that we absolutely get penalized for bragging. Absolutely. And this is a reality of the world that we live in. So my job here with you guys is to bring you right up to the line of bragging without crossing over. And to do that, it's about authenticity. So it's really taking the time to have that conversation with yourself inside and say like, who is it I really wanna be known for? And who is it I wanna be known for today that actually helps not only me, but my friends and my family and my team and everything that we need to be able to move these things forward. So really think about that. Um, and then of course, I'm gonna do the ROI conversation again. Um, so I asked my friend to do the purple exercise and I did the same for myself and decided I wanted to test out the word lady badass um, and see if what could happen. And so I spent 100 days posting something that talked about who I thought was a lady badass, or something that I thought was lady badass-ish, whatever, on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for 100 days. Just, and I posted the same thing on each site. And remarkably, after about 50 days or so, I started to get the hashtag, the original lady badass, in my own feeds back at me. I had the remarkable opportunity to get to have dinner at Kathy Ireland's house. She's lovely. I didn't know anybody at the dinner, and as we were going around the room having the, so what do you do conversation, introducing ourselves, I did my whole, well, I believe that every decision made about you and your opportunities is made in a room that you're not in. And then somebody across the table who I had not met yet said, aren't you that lady badass lady thing? Which then changed the whole conversation. I was like, this is fantastic. So you can really think, not only professionally, but who do you want to be and what story do you want to tell about yourself as you move forward? And it does, like, I, would, I am terrified going out there with something like, seriously, Lady Badass? That seems so goofy. Terrified about putting those things out, and it did take courage, and now I can stand up here and go, yes, I own the word Lady Badass. Um, and I think it's fantastic, and it's now become this global thing that we're doing. You can actually go to ladybadassery.com. It's super fun. So if you are needing a moment of courage, um, I'm here to help you guys. I hope this is not the first interaction we will have with you guys. So if you, I write uh, a newsletter every two weeks that I send out to anybody who's interested, where I ask people to up their game, I get super vulnerable. Um, I think I actually talked about how I used to sell snails on the playground when I was a little kid the other day in my newsletter. I promised to be fun. 
So if you're interested in signing up for the newsletter, you just text 38470, the word curious to that number, and it'll sign you up. Um, we also do uh, virtual coaching and all sorts of other things online, so we're happy to interact with you. And then I have an ask for the room. Um, I am on a mission to get in front of as many people as possible around this whole idea of just the simple one if you can introduce yourself in a different way. And hopefully you are all like, yeah, I think this is a really great idea, and I've got a friend who could hear that idea. And while companies like Ellie Mae, thank you very much, bring me in and actually help me run this as a business, if you are a 501c3, um, I will, especially in the Bay Area, show up for any event that you have as your entertainment to share this idea. So especially the women that work with other women's organizations and even the guys. From every age, I've talked to um, eight to 12-year-old girls all the way through. Um, we'd be delighted to come in and share this idea because we are on a mission to get to 100,000 people this year and I need your help to get there because I do believe that if we can all articulate why we are awesome, then share that with other people, then other people know what they are buying from you, why you are awesome, and will want you to do the work that you are really great at, will want you to be the person who thinks about the head and the heart, will want you to be the person who thinks about data architecture and people, will want you to be the person who says, oh, there's got to be a more efficient way of doing this. And when you get to be the person you really are, then you are happy and satisfied in your work, which means you do great work, which means the company does better, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I believe in all of the awesome in this room. Please find the time to figure out what you want to be known for and how you want that story told about yourself. And I promise you, promise you, magic things will happen. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.